you for that very warm welcome. Um, it, is, it is such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this outstanding lecture series. And I am thrilled to see so many of you here, people who are willing to engage in meaningful dialogue about this system of mass incarceration, a system that has decimated so many of our communities, destroyed so many families, and turned back the clock on racial progress in the United States. We stand now at a critical moment in our nation's history. We do have a presidential election going on. And notably, mass incarceration has not been a topic of discussion or debate. And not one of the debates was a question asked or an answer given, not only about poverty in the United States, but the millions who are locked into a permanent second-class status for life, the millions who are now trapped in a permanent undercast, the millions who are part of the other America. But in my view, the presidential election isn't the most important thing going on, at least not with respect to the work that has become the passion of my life. I believe we're at a critical moment in our history because for the first time in a long, long time, there are rumblings in the streets. There are rumblings and voices being raised and people who have been locked up and locked out beginning to find their voice, beginning to organize, beginning to think seriously about building a movement to end this system. And these rumblings are coming at a particularly important time. For the first time in more than 40 years, politicians across the political spectrum are beginning to raise questions about this race to incarcerate. They're beginning to wonder out loud whether we can afford the massive prison state that has been constructed in recent years. Now their concerns are not driven primarily, or perhaps at all, by the lives of people who have been trapped within the system, the families that have been destroyed. No, this sudden concern across the political spectrum is driven mainly by concerns about costs, how much it costs to lock people up in a time of economic crisis. And because politicians are reluctant to raise taxes on the predominantly white middle class, suddenly we hear conversation about maybe it's time for a little prison downsizing. And so two things are happening at the same time. You see that People are beginning to wake up, find their voice, and speak out at precisely the same time that a window is opening, a window of opportunity. I think the question that is posed by this moment in our nation's history is whether what will come of this time is just a little bit of prison downsizing so that this massive prison state suddenly becomes a little bit more affordable, will downsize somewhat and reach a new plateau of indifference. We'll pat ourselves on the back and say, well, a job well done. We shrunk the prison system a little bit and go on about our daily lives, reform activists moving on to something else even as millions remain trapped, cycling in and out of prisons and jails, or whether we might be standing now at the beginning of a new movement for social and racial justice, a movement that will not end until we defeat the system of mass incarceration and break the cycle of caste in America. We stand now, I believe, at a fork in the road. And I hope we will not sleep through this moment in our history.
Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once said there is, quote, nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution, end quote. And he was talking at that time about a profound moral revolution that was underway, the struggle for the recognition of the dignity and humanity of all kind, a struggle to end what was then America's latest caste system known as Jim Crow. And in the months before his death, he was speaking to a large audience and he told the story of Rip Van Winkle, who famously fell asleep for 20 years. And he pointed out to the audience that when Rip began his extended nap, there was a sign emblazoned on the wall of a nearby inn that had a picture of King George III on it. But when Rip woke up two decades later, that same sign had a picture of George Washington on it. And Dr. King said, what is most remarkable about the story of Rip Van Winkle isn't that he slept for 20 years, but that he had slept through a revolution. He said, quote, there are all too many people who, in some great period of social change, fail to achieve the new mental outlooks that the new situation demands. Well, I think his words are as relevant today as they were back then. Many of us, myself included, have slept through a revolution, actually a counter-revolution. A counter-revolution that has blown back so much of the progress that Dr. King and Ella Baker and countless other activists fought for and some died for. This revolution has occurred with barely a whimper of protest, even as millions, millions of people have been rounded up, locked up, and then stripped of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. While many of us have been asleep, a vast new system of racial and social control has emerged, one that would certainly have Dr. King and many others turning in their graves. I believe one day we may look back and wonder how we could have possibly have slept for so long. Well, I've been asked to share with you today the thesis of my book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness, and to a large extent, the title of the book speaks for itself. I believe that today, in the so-called era of color blindness, and yes, even in the age of Obama, something akin to a caste system is alive and well in America. The mass incarceration of poor people of color is tantamount to a new caste system, one specifically designed to address the social, political, and economic challenges of our time. It's the moral equivalent of Jim Crow. Now, I am always eager to point out that I didn't always think this way, that I was asleep for a long, long time, even as a civil rights lawyer and activist who spent most of their, my waking hours trying to work for racial justice. I didn't quite get it. I believed many of the myths that are sold to us today about the reason that our prison population has exploded and so many black men in particular find themselves in a perpetual cycle of marginality. I believe that poverty, broken homes, and bad schools could explain the quintupling of our prison population in a few short decades. I believed back then that we were more or less on the right path. The path that Dr. King and Ella Baker, so many others were traveling. I believed we were headed in the right direction, but we just had a long ways to go. I didn't realize back then that we had in fact made a dramatic U-turn and were headed back in so many ways right to where we had begun. In fact, back then I thought that people who made comparisons between mass incarceration and slavery or mass incarceration and Jim Crow were exaggerating, gauging in distortion, hyperbole. In fact, I thought many of the people who made those kinds of claims and those kinds of comparisons were actually doing more harm than good to efforts to reform our criminal justice system and achieve greater racial equality in the United States. 
but a decade makes a difference. For after years of working, representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement in poor communities of color and attempting to assist people who have been released from prison, re-enter into a society that had never shown much use for them in the first place. I had a series of experiences that began what I now call my awakening. I began to awaken to a racial reality that is just so obvious to me now that I'm nearly embarrassed in retrospect that I had been blind to it for so long. As I describe in the introduction to the book, what has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language we use to justify it. In the era of color blindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices that we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways in which it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, and exclusion from jury service are suddenly legal. As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America, we have merely redesigned it. Well, I had a number of experiences that began to open my eyes to what was really going on. And one in particular had a profound impact on me. It involved a young African-American man who was 19 years old. He forever changed the way I viewed not only our criminal justice system, but how I viewed myself as a civil rights lawyer and advocate. At the time, I was directing the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU in California, and we had launched a major campaign against racial profiling by the police. We called it the DWB campaign, or the Driving While Black or Brown campaign. And we had already sued the California Highway Patrol for racial profiling and their drug interdiction practices, but we were looking to sue some other police departments in California as well, departments that we knew were using discriminatory tactics and practices. And so we created a hotline number for people to call if they believe they've been stopped or targeted by the police on the basis of race. And we put up this hotline number in bil on billboards in Oakland and San Jose, communities around California, urging people to call the hotline number if they believe they have been stopped, or searched, targeted by the police simply because of the color of their skin. And in fact, within a few minutes, the first three minutes after we announced our hotline number on the evening news, we received thousands of calls. Our system crashed temporarily. We had to expand our capacity in order to deal with the volume of calls we were receiving. So I was spending my day interviewing one young black and brown man after another who had called the hotline reporting discriminatory stops and searches. And it was late in the day, it was late in the afternoon, and I was getting tired. And this young man walks into my office carrying a stack of papers about this thick. He had taken very detailed notes of his encounters with the police in his Oakland neighborhood over about a nine month period of time. He had descriptions of each encounter, what was said, what was done to him. He had names of witnesses, people who could corroborate what went down when the vehicle was pulled over or where he was stopped and frisked or made to lie spread eagle on the street. He had names of officers, in some cases even badge numbers. Just an unbelievable amount of documentation and detail of this pattern of stops he'd experienced over the past several months. And the stories he was telling were consistent with other stories we had heard coming out of his neighborhood about sweeps that were going on in this community. And so I started to think, maybe he's the one. Maybe he's our dream plaintiff 
Maybe he'll be our named plaintiff in the class action suit we're planning to file against the Oakland Police Department, challenging their discriminatory tactics and practices. So I start asking him more questions, and I'm getting more excited. I'm realizing he's a well-spoken young man. He's a good-looking young man. He'll, he'll do well with the media. And I start thinking, I think, I think he's the one. And we're vibing and talking. And then he says something that makes me pause. And I said, whoa, you know, wait a minute. What, what did you just say? What did you just say? Did you just say you're a felon? Did you just say you're a, a drug felon? And he gets quiet, and he looks down at the table for a minute, and then he looks up and looks me right in the eye, and he says, yeah, yeah, I'm a felon, but let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. Police planted drugs on me, and they set up me and my friends and beat us up, and he starts telling me this big, long story about how he was framed and set up by the police, and they were beat up, and, you know, I was just like, I am sorry. I am sorry. We cannot represent you if you have a felony record. I tried to explain to him that we had been screening people with prior felonies on their record. In fact, when people call the hotline, we would send a form to them to fill out asking them a bunch of questions about their experience with the police, and one of them was, have you ever been convicted of a felony? We believed we could not represent someone as a named plaintiff in a racial profiling case if they had a felony record because we knew that if we did, the media and law enforcement would be all over us saying, well, of course the police should be keeping an eye on him. He's a felon. He's a criminal. And we knew that we wouldn't be able to put him on the stand in front of a jury without him being cross-examined for an hour about his prior criminal history, thus undermining his credibility and shifting attention away from the law enforcement conduct and onto his past criminal history. So I tried to explain to him, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but we cannot represent you. And he becomes increasingly more agitated and more upset and starts saying, no, you don't understand. I'm telling you the truth. I was framed. I was set up. I'm innocent. You got to hear me out. I only took the plea because they were threatening me with, with decades behind bars. If I didn't take the plea, they said if I just took the felony, I could just get probation. I could just walk out. I just get probation. So I, I took it. I, I, was, I didn't want to do the time. I said, I am sorry, I am sorry. There's nothing that I can do. I cannot represent you. And finally, he becomes enraged. And he says to me, you're no better than the police. You're no better than the police. The minute I tell you I'm a felon, you just stop listening. Can't even hear what I have to say. He said, what's to become of me? What's to become of me? I can't get a job anywhere because of my felony record. I can't get a job anywhere. Where am I supposed to sleep? I can't even get into public housing because of my felony record. Says I have to sleep in my grandma's basement at night because nowhere else will take me in. What's to become of me? Says I can't even get food stamps to feed myself because of my felony record. How am I supposed to feed myself? How am I supposed to take care of myself as a man? He says, good luck finding one young black man in my neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet. They've gotten to us all already. And with that, he picks up all those papers, all those notes, and just starts ripping them up into tiny little pieces, throws them in the air. It's just snowing white paper in my office, and he walks out yelling at me, you're no better than the police. Can't believe I trusted you. Takes off. Well, several months after that, I'm doing a public access television show broadcasting live out of his neighborhood. I was doing public access TV because we were trying to organize thousands of people to get on buses and go to a demonstration at the state capitol protesting the governor's refusal to sign racial profiling legislation. And it was a couple of days before the demonstration, so I was doing this public access TV in his neighborhood urging people to get on the bus, go to the demonstration. It's broadcasting live out of his neighborhood. The minute the show goes off the air, he comes bursting into the studio, carrying this dirty potted plant. And he comes rushing up to me, and he's all emotional, practically on the verge of tears. He comes rushing up to me, thrusts the plant into my arms, and he says, I'm just here to tell you I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I treated you. I've been seeing you on the news. I see you out there trying to fight for our people, trying to do the right thing. I should have spoken to you like that. I should have treated you that way. 
I would have bought you some flowers, but I still don't have any money. I snatched this plant off my grandma's front porch. Here. <laughs> Just thrust it into my arms. And then he turns around and runs out of the building. I go chasing after him. He jumps into his broke down car and just takes off. He disappears. Well, several months after that, I'm in my office, open up the newspaper. And what's on the front page? Well, the Oakland Riders police scandal is broken. Turns out that a gang of police officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planting drugs on suspects, beating folks up in his neighborhood. And who is identified as the main officer accused of planting drugs on suspects and beating folks up? Well, the officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friend. And it was only then, only then, that the light bulb finally started to go on for me. And I thought to myself, he's right about me. I'm no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I just stopped listening. Couldn't even hear what he had to say. That was the beginning of me asking myself some hard questions of myself as a civil rights lawyer and advocate. How am I actually replicating the very forms of discrimination, exclusion, and marginalization I'm supposedly fighting against? I also started asking myself, why is it, really, that we haven't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet? What is really going on? And that began my own journey of asking myself and others a lot of hard questions and listening more carefully to the stories of those cycling in and out of our prison system. And what I learned in that process was that my great crime wasn't in failing to represent an innocent man. My great crime was in imagining that there was some path to racial justice that did not include those we view as guilty. I also learned some facts that blew my mind. I learned there are more African-American adults under correctional control today, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. I learned that as of 2004, more black men are disenfranchised then in 1870, the year the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that explicitly deny the right to vote on the basis of race. Now, of course, during the Jim Crow era, poll taxes and literacy tests operated to keep black folks from the polls. Well, today, felon disenfranchisement laws, and if one party has its way, voter ID laws, will accomplish what poll taxes and literacy tests ultimately could not. Today, 80% of black children growing, grow up living at least a significant part of their childhood years away from their fathers. There's a lot of reasons that this is the case, but one that is frequently ignored is the role of mass incarceration. There was a study published uh, an article published in The Economist magazine not so long ago entitled, How the Mass Incarceration of Black Men Harms Black Women. And the article explained that the majority of black women in the United States, including about 70% of professional black women, are unmarried. And that this is due largely to the mass incarceration of black men, which takes them out of the dating pool the years they'd be most likely to commit to a partner or to a family. But what's worse is that by branding them criminals and felons at early ages, often before they're even old enough to vote, they're rendered permanently unemployable in the legal job market for the most part, virtually guaranteeing that most will cycle in and out of prison for the rest of their lives. <laughs> 
Now, the stereotype we have in the media today is often one of black men being a bunch of deadbeat dads that don't want to do right by their children. But the research actually shows that contrary to the image presented in the media, that if you look at the research, at the empirical evidence, it shows that black men actually make more of an effort than men of any other racial or ethnic group to maintain meaningful contact with their children following separation due to divorce, incarceration, or any other factor. But no racial or ethnic group in America faces such extraordinary challenges to playing the role of a traditional father today and faces more barriers to meaningful engagement with their families than black men. But it hasn't stopped them from trying. What the research shows is that we could all be better parents. White men could do a better job of being fathers. Latino men could do a better job of being fathers. Black women could do a better job of being mothers. I know I could. We could all do a much better job, but structurally, one group, one group has seen families decimated, decimated through the involuntary separation of parent and child. And this does not affect some small segment of the African-American community. To the contrary, in large urban areas today, more than half of working age African-American men now have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. In fact, in some major cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, Baltimore, some major cities the stats are far worse. In Chicago, for example, one study showed that if you take into account prisoners, in fact, if you count prisoners as people, and prisoners, of course, are excluded from poverty statistics and unemployment data, thus masking the severity of racial inequality in the United States. But if you actually count prisoners as people, nearly 80% of working age African American men in the Chicago area now have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, cast, a group of people defined largely by race, relegated to a permanent second class status by law. Now, I find that when I tell people today that I now believe that our system of mass incarceration functions much like a caste system, shuttling children from decrepit underfunded schools to brand new high-tech prisons, locking millions into a permanent undercast. People say, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. Our criminal justice system isn't a system of racial control, it's a system of crime control. And if black folks would just stop running around committing so many crimes, they wouldn't have to worry about being locked up and then stripped of their basic civil and human rights. Well, therein lies the greatest myth about mass incarceration, namely that it's been driven by crime and crime rates. It's not true. It's just not true. Over the past few decades, our prison population has quintupled, not doubled or tripled, quintupled. As a nation, we went from a prison population of about 350,000 to now well over 2 million. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of even highly repressive regimes like Russia or China or Iran. But again, this, is, this cannot be explained simply by crime rates. During that same three-decade period of time where our prison population quintupled, during that same period of time, crime rates fluctuated. Went up, went down, went back up again, went down again. And today, as bad as crime rates are in many parts of the country, nationally, crime rates are at historical lows. But incarceration rates have consistently soared. 
Most criminologists and sociologists today will acknowledge that crime rates and incarceration rates in the United States have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have soared regardless of whether crime was going up or going down in any given community or the nation as a whole. So how do we manage that? How do we manage to quintuple a nation's prison population in just a few decades, if not due to crime or crime rates? Well, the answer is the war on drugs and the get tough movement, the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. Drug convictions alone, just drug convictions, accounted for about two-thirds of the increase in the federal prison system and more than half of the increase in the state prison system between 1985 and 2000, the period of our prison system's most dramatic expansion. Drug convictions have increased more than 1,000% since the drug war began. I mean, to get a sense of how large a contribution the war on drugs has made to mass incarceration, consider this. There are more people in prisons and jails today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Now, most Americans violate drug laws in their lifetime. That's a fact, most do. But the enemy in this war has been racially defined. Not by accident, the drug war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites, or sell. Now, that defies our basic racial stereotypes about who drug dealers are today. You picture a drug dealer in your mind. Be honest. If you're like most Americans, you probably picture some black kid standing on the street corner with his pants sagging down. And plenty of drug dealing happens in the hood, but it happens everywhere else in America as well. It does. Yeah. A white kid who's living in rural Nebraska does not drive to the hood to get his marijuana, his meth, his cocaine, his ecstasy. No. No, he gets it most likely from someone of his own race down the road. Drug dealing happens on college campuses and universities. It happens in middle class white communities. It happens in wealthy communities. Drug dealing happens in communities of all colors, all classes. But those who do time for drug crime are overwhelmingly black and brown. In some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been one race, African American. Now, I find that when people see the data, actually see the data, they say, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, th that, those disparities, that's, that's a shame. But you know, it makes sense to wage a drug war in the hood because that's where the violent offenders are. That's where the drug kingpins can be found. In fact, in my experience, most people seem to imagine that the war on drugs was declared in response to the emergence of crack cocaine in inner city communities and the related violence. For a long time, I believed that too. But that's not the case. The current drug war was declared in 1982 at a time when drug crime was actually on the decline, not on the rise. It was before, not after, crack began to ravage inner city communities and become a media sensation. President Richard Nixon was the first to coin the term a war on drugs, but it was President Ronald Reagan who turned that rhetorical war into a literal one. And at the time he declared his drug war, drug crime was actually on the decline, not on the rise, and less than 3% of the American population even identified drugs as the nation's most pressing concern. So why declare a war, an all-out war, if drug crime is on the decline and the American population isn't much concerned about drugs? Well, from the outset, the war on drugs had relatively little to do with genuine concern about drug addiction or drug abuse and nearly everything to do with politics, racial politics. <laughs> 
Numerous historians and political scientists have now documented that the war on drugs was part of a grand Republican Party strategy, known as the Southern Strategy, of using racially coded get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who were anxious about and resentful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. Now, to be fair, I think we have to acknowledge that poor and working class whites really had their world rocked by the civil rights movement. Wealthy whites could you know, send their kids to private schools, give their kids all of the advantages that wealth has to offer. But poor and working class whites, many of whom themselves were struggling for survival, they were faced with a social demotion. It was their kids that might get bussed across town to go to a school they believed was inferior. It was their kids and themselves who were suddenly forced to compete on equal terms for limited jobs with this whole new group of people they've been taught their whole lives to believe were inferior to them. And then to make matters worse from their perspective, affirmative action programs were creating this impression that black folks were now leapfrogging over them on their way to Ivy League schools or fancy jobs in corporate America. And this state of affairs created an enormous amount of fear, resentment, anxiety, but it also created an enormous political opportunity. Pollsters and political strategists found that thinly veiled promises to get tough on them, a group not so subtly defined by race, could be enormously successful in persuading poor and working class whites to defect from the Democratic New Deal coalition and join the Republican Party in droves. In the words of H.R. Haldeman, President Richard Nixon's former chief of staff, he described the strategy this way. The whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to, end quote. Well, they did. And a couple of years after Reagan's drug war was announced, crack began to ravage inner city communities. And there were more than a few civil rights activists who thought it was more than a coincidence that crack would show up after, rather than before, an all-out drug war had been declared. But coincidence or not, there's no doubt that the Reagan administration seized on the emergence of crack cocaine with some glee, actually hiring staff whose job it was to publicize inner city crack babies, crack dealers, the so-called crack whores, and crack-related violence. Their goal was to make crack a media sensation in the hopes that it would bolster public support for a drug war they had already declared and help to persuade Congress to devote millions more dollars to waging it. And the plan worked like a charm. Almost overnight, millions of dollars flowed into law enforcement coffers to wage this literal war. And legislators began competing with each other to pass ever harsher mandatory minimum sentences for minor drug crime, sentences harsher than murderers receive in many other Western democracies. And soon, Democrats began competing with Republicans to prove they could be even tougher on them than their Republican counterparts. And so it was President Bill Clinton who escalated the drug war far beyond what his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. It was the Clinton administration that championed laws banning drug offenders from federal financial aid for schooling upon their release, banning drug offenders and people with criminal records from public housing, banning drug offenders even from food stamps for the rest of their lives. To a large extent, so many of the rules, laws, policies, and practices that now constitute the basic architecture of this new caste system was championed by a Democratic administration desperate to win back those so-called white swing voters, the folks that had defected from the Democratic Party 
in the wake of the civil rights movement. And so here we are, just a couple decades later, and millions of people are now trapped. 45 million people have been arrested in the drug war since it began. Millions of people locked up and permanently locked out. And yet even people who are familiar with this history will say, but we still need to get tough on them. They're the violent offenders. It's in the hood where the drug kingpins can be found. But what so many don't realize is this drug war has never been focused primarily on rooting out the violent offenders or the drug kingpins. No, federal funding has flowed to those state or local law enforcement agencies that boost the numbers of drug arrests. It's been a numbers game. State and local law enforcement agencies have been rewarded in cash for the sheer numbers of people swept into the system for drug offenses, virtually guaranteeing that police will go out looking for the so-called low-hanging fruit, stopping, frisking, searching as many people as possible in an effort to boost their numbers and to ensure their funding streams continue to flow. And to make matters worse, federal drug forfeiture laws allow state and local law enforcement officials to keep for their own use, not personal use, the use of the department, to keep for the department's own use, up to 80% of the cash, cars, homes seized from suspected drug offenders, giving law enforcement a direct monetary interest, not in ending drug abuse or drug addiction, but in the longevity of this war itself. And the results are predictable. Overwhelming majority of people arrested in the drug war have been arrested for primarily you know, nonviolent, relatively minor offenses. In 2005, for example, four out of five drug arrests were for simple possession, only one out of five were for sales. Most people in state prison for drug offenses have no history of violence or even significant selling activity. And in the 1990s, the Clinton years, the period of the greatest escalation of the drug war, nearly 80% of the increase in drug arrests were for marijuana possession, a drug that's been shown now to be less harmful, less addictive than alcohol or tobacco, and at least, if not more prevalent, in middle-class white communities and on college campuses as it is in the hood. But by waging this drug war almost exclusively in the hood, we've managed to create a vast new racial undercaste in an astonishingly short period of time. Well, I find these days that many people say, well, if it's really all that bad, then why don't you just file a lawsuit and stop it? Is it wouldn't this be unconstitutional if it were really going on in the way that you describe? Well, it was once possible to challenge racial bias in our criminal justice system, but it is no longer, not in any meaningful sense. The US Supreme Court has closed the courthouse doors to claims of racial bias at every stage of the criminal justice process from stops and searches to plea bargaining and sentencing. In a series of cases beginning with McCleskey versus Kemp and Armstrong versus the United States, the court has ruled that it doesn't matter how overwhelming the statistical evidence of discrimination might be. It doesn't matter how severe the racial disparities are. Unless you can offer proof of conscious intentional bias tantamount to an admission by police officer, or prosecutor, a bias, you can't even state a claim for race discrimination in our criminal justice system today. Now that poses more than a small challenge given that today, in this era of colorblindness, most police officers know better than to say, well, yes, Your Honor, the reason I stopped him was because he, well, he was black. <laughs> and most prosecutors know better than to say, well, you know, Your Honor, I would have given him a better plea deal, but he's from the hood, he's black, he didn't look like he's going anywhere with his life. No second chances for him. No, 
Most law enforcement officials, like the rest of us, know better than to state our racial biases and stereotypes out loud. But more importantly, so many of the biases and stereotypes that drive law enforcement decision making operate on such an unconscious level that most well-meaning, well-intentioned officers can't even admit to themselves their own bias. They try. But the US Supreme Court has ruled that you can't even state a claim for discrimination today unless you can offer some kind of proof, smoking gun, of conscious intentional bias, tantamount to a racial slur or admission by a law enforcement officer. And on top of all that, the US Supreme Court has eviscerated Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures. You know, it used to be the case, once upon a time, that a police officer couldn't just roll up to you on the street, stop you, frisk you, search you, interrogate you about where you're going, what you're doing, what you're up to. Today, they can. Today, they can, as long as they get consent. Now, what's consent? Consent is when a police officer walks up to a young man on the street, the officer has one hand on his gun, and he says, son, we put your hands up in the air so I can frisk you and see if you got anything on you? And the kid says, uh-huh. That's consent, and he's just waived his Fourth Amendment right to unreasonable searches and seizures. The law enforcement official doesn't have to have a shred of evidence, no reasonable suspicion, no probable cause, not a shred of evidence to engage in that encounter. Now, I have found in my own work that very often when people refuse consent and say, no, officer, what did I do? Why, why, why do you want to search me? The officer will go right ahead and search anyway, frisk anyway, knowing full well that in a court of law, it will be the officer's word against that young black man about what was said on that street corner that night. So as a practical matter, the US Supreme Court has given the police license to stop, frisk, search just about anyone, anywhere. But the police don't engage in these tactics just anywhere. They don't do it on college campuses, even though plenty of drugs can be found there. They don't do it in middle class white neighborhoods though criminal activity and drug use and dealing happens there, too. They reserve these tactics for the hood, knowing full well that once swept in to your word against a police officer in a court of law, and that most of those who are swept in from ghettoized communities are those our nation has come to view as largely disposable not worthy of our genuine care and concern. But of course, being swept into the system is only just the beginning for millions, because once you've been swept in and branded a criminal or felon, you're ushered into a parallel social universe in which the basic civil and human rights that so many others take for granted no longer apply to you. Employment discrimination is perfectly legal. For the rest of your life, you've got to check that box on employment applications asking, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And it doesn't matter if that felony happened a few weeks ago, a few years ago, or 45 years ago. For the rest of your life, you've got to check that box, knowing full well the odds are sky high, your application's going straight to the trash. Many people will say to me, well, come on. You're just making excuses for people. You know, when they get out of prison, if they try, if they really, if they really want to work. If they really want to work, they can find work. I mean, they could get a job at McDonald's or something. Well, getting a job at McDonald's is no easy feat if you have a felony record. Hundreds of professional licenses are off limits to people convicted of felonies. I often hear, well, they should start their own businesses then. Never mind that they have no money, but you should start your own business. Hundreds of professional licenses are off limits to people convicted of felonies. In my state, in Ohio, you can't even get a license to be a barber if you've been convicted of a felony. Housing discrimination is perfectly legal as well. Public housing projects, private landlords free to discriminate. Public benefits may be off limits to you. Again, thanks to President Clinton, under federal law, you've been convicted of a drug felony. You're deemed ineligible for food stamps for the rest of your life. Fortunately, many states have opted out of this ban on food stamps, but it 
remains the case that thousands of people can't even get food stamps, food to feed themselves because they were once caught with drugs. What are folks released from prison expected to do? Can't get a job, barred from housing, even food stamps may be off limits to you. Well, apparently what we expect people to do is to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And then in a growing number of states, you're actually expected to pay back the costs of your imprisonment. And all of this is considered a condition of your probation or parole. Can be. And then get this, if you're one of the lucky few who actually manages to get a job following release from prison, up to 100% of your wages can be legally garnished. 100% to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs, accumulate back child support. What are folks released from prison expected to do? Or perhaps a better question is, what does the system seem designed to do? Seems designed, in my view, to send folks right back to prison which is what, in fact, happens the vast majority of the time. About 70% of people released from prison return within three years, and the majority of those who return in some states do so in a matter of months, because the challenges associated with mere survival on the outside are so immense. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, my own view is that nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending mass incarceration in America. And if you're tempted to believe that something less will do, if you think surely a new movement isn't really required, well, consider this. If we were to return to the rates of incarceration we had in the 1970s, before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement really kicked off, we would have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. Four out of five. More than a million people employed by the criminal justice system would lose their jobs. Most new prison construction has occurred in predominantly white rural communities. Many of these communities have come to believe that prisons are the source of their economic growth, their source of jobs. Many of these communities have been sold on prisons as an answer to their economic woes, and very often the promises did not quite live up to what they were advertised. But nonetheless, these communities come to believe that their survival depends on those prisons being full. Those prisons across America would have to close down. Private prison companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange and doing quite well in a time of economic recession those companies would be forced to go bankrupt, belly up. This system is now so deeply rooted in our social, political, and economic structure that it's not going to just fade away. It's not going to just downsize out of sight without a major upheaval, a fairly radical shift in our public consciousness. Now, I know that many people today will say, well, there is just no hope of ending mass incarceration in America. Just as many people were resigned to Jim Crow in the South and would say, yeah, you know, that's a shame, but that's just the way that it is. Today, I find that many people view the millions cycling in and out of our prisons and jails as just an unfortunate but inalterable fact of American life. Well, I am confident that Dr. King, Ella Baker, Sojourner Truth, Malcolm X, many others who risked their lives to end earlier systems of racial and social control would not be so easily deterred. So we have got to be willing to go back and pick up where they left off and do the hard work of movement building on behalf of poor people of all colors. Yes. Yes. In, in 1968, Dr. King told advocates that the time had come to shift from a civil rights movement to a human rights movement. He said, 
Meaningful equality can't be achieved through civil rights alone. Without basic human rights, the right to work, the right to shelter, the right to quality education, without basic human rights, he said, civil rights are an empty promise. So in honor of all those who worked to end the old Jim Crow, I hope we will build a human rights movement to end mass incarceration, a movement for education, not incarceration, a move for jobs, not jails. This has got to be a movement to end all forms of discrimination against people released from prison, discrimination that denies them their basic human rights to work, and to shelter, to food. How do we build this movement? Well, as I said, the rumblings have already begun. There are organizations alive and well today, groups like Critical Resistance and All of Us or None, who have been working for years to build this movement. There have been people in cities across America who have been working tirelessly on behalf of those who are locked up and locked out. How do we build upon this work and build a movement that will shake the foundations of the system as a whole? Well, first, I think it's going to require a lot from the rest of us. We have got to be willing to tell the truth. We have got to be willing to admit out loud that we as a nation have managed to recreate a caste-like system in this country. And we've got to be willing to tell this truth in our schools, in our churches, in our mosques, in our places of worship. We've got to be willing to tell this truth behind bars, in juvenile detention centers, in reentry centers. We've got to be willing to tell this truth so that a genuine awakening can begin. Because as long as we remain in a state of deep denial, we will continue to tinker with this machine, and we'll have the same conversation 40 years from now. So we have got to be willing to tell the truth. But of course, just a lot of talk isn't going to be enough. It's required, but it isn't enough. We've also got to be willing to build an underground railroad for people returning home from prison. People trying to make a genuine break for freedom. We have got to be willing to open our homes, open our places of work, open our schools to people returning home from prison and provide them the desperately needed help and support as they try to find work and shelter and a quality education, try to find food. We've got to be there with open arms and an open heart to support them as well as to support the families who have loved ones behind bars, who often feel so isolated and alone. We've got to create safe, open, loving spaces for people who are struggling for survival in this era of mass incarceration. But of course, that isn't going to be enough either. Because just as in the days of slavery, it wasn't enough to shuttle a few to freedom. It wasn't enough to open your home or your heart to a few as they made a genuine break for freedom. You had to be willing to work for abolition. Well, today, I believe we have got to be willing to work for abolition of this system of mass incarceration as a whole. We do. We've got to be willing to end it. And that means ending the war on drugs. We've spent a trillion dollars waging this drug war since it began. Millions of lives shattered and destroyed, and yet rates of drug addiction and drug abuse remain largely unchanged. We've got to stop the madness end the war on drugs. No one should be saddled with a felony record for the rest of their life because they were once caught with some drugs. We can end this. We can do it. And we've also got to end all these forms of legal discrimination against people released from prison, discrimination that denies them basic human rights to work and to shelter and to food. And last but not least, we have got to shift from a purely punitive approach to dealing with violence and violent crime in our communities, 
to a more restorative and rehabilitative approach, one that takes seriously the needs of the victim, the community, the offender, all as a whole. So we've got a lot of work to do. And if it seems like too much, if it seems like it can't possibly be done, keep in mind that all of this, all of these practices and institutions and policies rest upon one core belief. And it's the same core belief that sustained Jim Crow. It's the belief that some of us, some of us, are not worthy of genuine care, compassion, or concern. And when we effectively challenge that core belief, this whole system begins to fall like dominoes. A multiracial, multi-ethnic human rights movement must be born, one that takes seriously the dignity and humanity of all people. And it's got to be multiracial and multi-ethnic. Because although this war on drugs might have been born with black folks in mind, it is a war that has destroyed the lives of people and communities of all colors. It has. And although black men have borne the initial brunt of this war, Latino men are now catching up. And women are the fastest growing segment of our prison system today. And the same divisive politics that gave birth to the drug war and the race to incarcerate, those same divisive politics are giving birth to another prison building boom, this one aimed at suspected illegal immigrants. So we have got to be willing to connect the dots and build a multiracial, multi-ethnic movement on behalf of all of us. But before this movement can truly get underway, a great awakening is required. We have got to awaken from this colorblind slumber that we've been in to the realities of race in America. And we've got to be willing to embrace those labeled criminals. Not necessarily all their behavior, but them, their humanness. For it has been the refusal and failure to recognize the dignity and humanity of all people that has been the sturdy foundation for every caste system that has ever existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. It's our task, I firmly believe, to end not just mass incarceration, not just the war on drugs, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you.